Hello there, this is Peter Gade with the USMLE RX Express team, and in this section of pharmacology we'll be talking about the autonomic drugs. There's quite a bit of material in this section, but the information presented here is very testable, so we'll do well to understand it. Let's begin by reviewing the overall structure of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system can be broken down into the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. The sympathetic division is responsible for the so-called fight-or-flight response. The parasympathetic division, on the other hand, is more commonly associated with resting and digesting. Notice that the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system innervate many of the same tissues. Here we have them listed as cardiac and smooth muscle, certain gland cells, and other nerve terminals. In these cases, the two divisions have opposing effects on one another and we'll talk about that quite a bit in subsequent slides. The autonomic nervous system has what can be called a two-neuron system. Both the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions follow this general rule. You can see that the first neuron has its soma in the central nervous system, that is, the spinal cord, and extends its axon to reach what is known as a ganglion. There, neuron number one synapses with neuron number two. Neuron number two, of course, has its soma in this ganglion, and then extends its axon to reach target tissues. This is what we mean by the two-neuron system. You can see that the sympathetic division follows the same rule. Here is the soma of the first neuron, which is found in the spinal cord, and its axon extends out and reaches a ganglion. The second neuron has its soma within this ganglion and extends out to reach its own target organ. So again, neuron number one and neuron number two. I'm going to redraw this here. This schematic is useful because in the autonomic nervous system, the first neuron always releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which we abbreviate ACH. On the second neuron, the acetylcholine released always binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. This is true whether we are talking about the parasympathetic or the sympathetic division. Notice that in the schematic where I write nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, in the figure we simply labeled it as an N. Once activated, the second neuron, on the other hand, can release a variety of neurotransmitters. And that all depends on which division that second neuron belongs to. And we'll discuss this in a moment. Notice that in the figure here we've also drawn out the somatic nervous system that is, those nerve fibers that innervate voluntary skeletal muscle. Notice that this is not a two-neuron system. From the spinal cord, we have a single neuron, which is located in the anterior or ventral horn, which extends all the way out to reach its target organ. This is an important difference to note. In the two-neuron system, we call the first neuron, which releases acetylcholine, the preganglionic neuron. And that's because it is the neuron which precedes the ganglion. By analogy, the second neuron is known as the postganglionic neuron. Notice that in the parasympathetic nervous system, the first or preganglionic neuron is long. The ganglion itself is very close to the target tissue, whereas in the sympathetic division, the first neuron is relatively short, because the ganglion, which is found in a series of ganglia, known as the sympathetic trunk, which you see here, is relatively close to the spinal cord. To remember this, you can use the mnemonic para long pre. That is, the preganglionic neuron of the parasympathetic division is long. Para long pre. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about the second or postganglionic neuron. But first, let me clear up this image a little bit. In the parasympathetic division, the second neuron, just like the first, releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. The target tissues bind acetylcholine with the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, which we've abbreviated in the figure as an M. Notice that this is different from what we saw in the ganglion. In the ganglion, the first neuron released acetylcholine, which then bound to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We'll talk about the differences between these two receptors in subsequent slides, but for now I just want to mention that point. But it should be easy to remember that each of the two neurons in the two-neuron system of the parasympathetic division both release acetylcholine. This is not true for the sympathetic division. 
In the sympathetic division, the general rule is that the second neuron releases norepinephrine, which we've abbreviated as NE. Target tissues, like cardiac and smooth muscle, will have adrenergic receptors, which then bind this norepinephrine. However, sympathetic nerves also innervate vascular smooth muscle cells, which are found in the kidney. And here these neurons release dopamine and other catecholamine derivatives, like norepinephrine, to exert their effects. Notice that instead of the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, which we see in cardiac and smooth muscle cells, the vascular smooth muscle cells of the kidney are enriched with dopamine receptors. And this is how the sympathetic system exerts its effects on this tissue. Interestingly, neurons of the sympathetic system can also release acetylcholine, which we see here. This occurs in sweat glands. When acetylcholine is released here, it binds to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, which are found on sweat glands, and which then stimulates these glands to produce sweat, a common feature of the flight or fight response. Finally, we'll discuss the special case of the adrenal medulla, which is shown here. Note that we have our first neuron of the sympathetic division. It extends its axon into the adrenal medulla, where, of course, it will release acetylcholine. But where exactly is our second neuron? Well, the cells of the adrenal medulla, which are known as chromaffin cells, are actually derived from the neural crest. That is, they are essentially modified second neurons of the sympathetic division, which is why, when they are stimulated by the first neuron, they are induced to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. But instead of releasing these neurotransmitters onto specific target tissues, they release them directly into the blood, which results in systemic responses, which are associated with a fight-or-flight response. So, in summary, the autonomic nervous system can be divided into two divisions, the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. Each of these divisions operates by a two-neuron system. The first, or preganglionic neuron, releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are found on the second, or postganglionic neuron. Depending on the type, the second neuron can release any number of neurotransmitters, which then exert their effects on target tissues. Okay, next let's talk about these acetylcholine receptors which are found throughout the nervous system. Remember that in the previous slide, I mentioned two types, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which I abbreviated as NACHR, and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, which I abbreviated MACHR. Remember that in the drawing, these were signified with the letter N or the letter M. There's a further division of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There's the N subtype N which are those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are found on neurons, specifically in the autonomic ganglia, and N subtype M, which are those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are found in the neuromuscular junction, the M standing for muscular. However, the most important thing to realize is the difference between the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, although both of these receptors bind acetylcholine, they are entirely different. As the name suggests, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors were found to bind nicotine, whereas the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors were found to bind muscarin, which is derived from certain mushrooms. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is actually a sodium-potassium channel. When acetylcholine binds this receptor, the receptor itself undergoes a conformational change which allows sodium and potassium ions to flow in and out of a cell. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, on the other hand, are G-protein-coupled receptors, which are abbreviated GP-CRs. These receptors are of the famous 7-transmembrane domain motif. That is, they sort of look like this. If these are the two layers of our cell membrane, G-protein-coupled receptors are embedded within that membrane. Here we have the extracellular environment, and here we have the intracellular environment. When acetylcholine binds to the GPCR, you have a conformational change in the receptor which then activates intracellular signaling pathways. Because of this, effects which are mediated through GPCRs are relatively slower than those which are mediated through ion channels, such as the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The intracellular signaling pathway is triggered when the G-protein coupled receptor activates a molecule which is known as a G-protein, hence the name. 
G proteins are trimeric complexes, which have an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit. When a G protein coupled receptor binds to its ligand, it can then activate the G protein, which actually results in the dissociation of the G protein into two parts, the alpha subunit and the beta gamma subunit. As we'll discuss on the next slide, there are three very important classes of G proteins. There is the GQ class, the GI class, and the GS class. And each one of these classes has a very different downstream effect, which we'll also discuss. Before we move on, I'll also just briefly mention that there are different types of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. There are actually five classes, which we call M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. Again, we'll discuss these in the next slide.